News on the Mark! Legendary is Citizen Kane, the picture that lives on in the hearts and minds of millions. Today, almost as legendary is the Criterion Collection, world's most famous boutique label. Here it was that in 1984, the label's first release was Citizen Kane. A deluxe special edition Laserdisc broke new ground in the then early days of home video. Now, after 30 years of separation, Kane returns to the fold in a new 4K restoration. Spine number one has become Spine 1104. A new entry for the company into the UHD realm. Contents of Kane's palatial UHD. Interviews, commentaries, video essays, the very radio plays of the Mercury. A collection of everything so big it could never be catalogued or appraised. Enough for four discs. The loot of the world. Like the immortals, Kane's legacy leaves many stones to mark its grave. Since the camera, Kane is the greatest monument a man has built to cinema. Its humble beginnings in the Mercury Theater, an upstart group, Kane's energy and its glory held dominion over legendary cinematography, cinematic breakthroughs, the entire RKO technical staff, an empire upon an empire of talent. Famed in American legend is the origin of Kane. How to boy wonder Orson Welles by RKO in 1939 was awarded the greatest contract in motion picture history. The final cut. Kane found its way onto many video releases. The Criterion Laserdisc being the most revolutionary. Other companies would reissue the picture later on. Criterion releases a deluxe version for the last time. For 30 years, Kane appeared in Turner and Warner Brothers video issues. No boutique label reissues. No innovation in overall package. No release that fans did not support or denounce. Often support, then denounce. <laughs> Many video releases, many disappointments. First, the Lowry Digital Master on DVD, which had horrible over-sharpening and digital noise reduction. Ten years after its first DVD, Kane debuted on Blu-ray, new format of high-definition capability. For release two, on this greater capacity Blu-ray, Kane was restored by Warner Brothers. Conceived for the ultimate treatment, Carrying over DVD extras, but featuring the still lackluster audio track. Why? No man can say. Kane, as impressive a Criterion announcement as it was, in all corners was never granted approval of its cover design by the fans of physical media. Then, suddenly, just as initial copies were released, an error. Painful. Ignominious. Error that caused the Blu-ray disc to be unwatchable, forever marking those discs with HDR to SDR conversion failure. Criterion issue statement of recall program. Release delayed. Untold copies pulled from store shelves. Unsold. Scrapped. Kane helped to change the world, but Kane's world is now history. The great picture itself lived to be history, outlived its power to make it. Yet alone in its legendary, already decaying public standing, welcoming yet seldom newly embraced, never dated, an emperor of undying strength continues to direct its everlasting social conscious, sparingly attempting to sway as it always has the destinies of an audience that had never ceased to listen to it, never ceased to trust it. Then in this year, as it must to all pictures. Renewal came to Citizen Kane. Yo! On the mark! That's it! Hello. Hello. Stand by. I'll tell you if we want to run it again. Well? 
Hello and welcome back to this Downfall Idealistic Crusade. Today's video is one I've been uh, wanting to do ever since the announcement came that Criterion was being able to relicense the original Spy Number 1 Citizen Kane, the first ever Laserdisc release in their collection all the way back in 1984, and the first film that launched the Criterion Collection into becoming the world's best-known boutique label and helped them along with the uh, nearly simultaneous release of King Kong, Spy Number 2, uh, pioneer the home video format in terms of developing the special features and supplemental section, in addition to presenting the films on disc in full CAV transfers for the best possible video quality at the time of release in 1984. The company was last able to release it as Spine 142 in their Laserdisc series as a special edition for the 50th anniversary in 1991, which I have here behind me. And then after that, uh, it has been held by Turner slash Warner Brothers, who distributes the film, and has been released exclusively by them. Uh, so it's getting licensed out as one of the crown jewels of the entire uh, Warner Library, and really the crown jewel of the RKO Library that's held under Warner Brothers now, uh, is, is big news. And honestly, it is a very fantastic thing because it allowed the film to be uh, developed further on home video and not have some of the techniques applied that get applied to the standard Warner Studio label releases for big name titles. They don't necessarily get as much uh, intensive care as they deserve and the extras are usually somewhat lacking as a number of came releases have been. There are good extras but they always leave you wanting more. So it's getting licensed to Criterion especially as as their uh, one of their UHD debuts as Spine 1104 uh, was really fantastic news. The reason why this review is coming so much later is, of course, the defective Blu-ray disc that it was shipped with with the SDR conversion failure from the HDR 4K master, and that meant having to do the whole process of uh, mailing in or destroying your defective discs and waiting for a replacement, which did take several months. Uh, it was a Simple and straightforward process, but yeah, I did start to wonder if I was ever going to get a replacement because I had to wait several months and then all of a sudden just, you know, got an email and it finally showed up in the mail. So it did take some time, but it is, of course, uh, it, at least it was properly fixed because it was a drastic error that meant the film was unwatchable on the 1080p Blu-ray disc. To put it mildly, I'm a bit of a Citizen Kane nerd and an Orson Welles fanatic, if it wasn't obvious behind me. And of course, the, you know, I have so many books on Welles that uh, these are just a mere sampling of the books I have on Welles. And of course, I have more behind me propping up the box set to have a, have a nicer looking display. So uh, I was able to piece together a nice little uh, cane display for the backdrop, as I like to do for these. So just to say that this will be a, a little bit more in-depth than your typical average review, because there's just so much to talk about, and uh, Kane is such a a giant in in the in the realm of motion picture history that uh, as a film as an achievement uh, it, it's its legacy is overwhelming. Its its reputation as the greatest film ever made is. It's, is something that is daunting to a lot of people, which leads to the inevitable backlash and the jokes, and that really took off when the AFI Top 100 list was done for the first time. And, of course, it has topped the sight and sound poll many times until 2012 when it was dethroned by Vertigo. Uh, but if it, it, you can't really rate films in, in that manner. It, it's it's you know it's it's a fun thing to do but it, to, to try and do i should say but it is not any sort of definitive way to uh judge one one picture versus another it is just uh it, it's it's more of a of a cheap marketing thing really uh the sight and sound poll is is the only one that really i think has has great merit to it because it's a lot of uh critics and directors and 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 people in the industry every 10 years uh and it's a conducted poll and it shows the passage of time and how opinions change over time so that that one basically all, all of these lists are just great indicators of of titles that you need to see that you need to have a background with but but Kane in particular 
if if there had to be one 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 picture to point to as you know okay if there had to be a greatest film ever made you know this makes sense uh, because it has everything it would have to be Citizen Kane. Uh, it, 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 that's that's why I've always been fine with that moniker, and if people want to make fun of it, that's fine. But because it has everything, and it brings together every element of the performing arts by not only utilizing every single aspect of the camera and motion picture production, but also theater and theater staging and radio production, all of that being fused together as it, 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 it makes the film a lightning rod. It is one of the films you go back to for inspiration, for, uh, for pulling yourself out of the doldrums. It is, but it has an even, even more special identity than that because really seeing Kane for a cinephile is like realizing what being alive is, I think. I don't think that's too much to say. That's how intensive Citizen Kane is as an experience because it not only is an overpowering, deeply emotional story about uh, the, you know, simply the fact that money can't buy you everything. <laughs> I mean, you can boil it down to as simple of a statement as that if you want to. Uh, it's also about the simple fact that for a good number of people, it is simply impossible to connect with the rest of humanity. And uh, the, also about the nature of humanity to turn upon itself. Uh, it, it can be boiled down to simple ideas and core tenets and the entire idea of Rosebud as a device uh, Wells himself famously was not really a fan of and called it dollar book Freud uh, but itself is a beautiful device much is made of the life-changing contract RKO offered Wells to come to Hollywood to make films as long as they had a budget of under a million dollars RKO had story approval and that was it they were to be entirely done by Wells and the Mercury Production Unit. So it basically gave Orson Welles autonomy and, of course, Final Cut as well, which made him pretty much the envy of every person in Hollywood and didn't endear the Mercury Group to anyone who, who actually... Uh, well, I should say, those who were actually old hands in the industry and those who really wanted to push things and to break new ground welcomed the Mercury Troop. So uh, this is why you had Greg Toland actively seek Wells out and say, I want to make your movie because you, essentially because you don't know what the hell you're doing. And that's because Toland was not just trying to push the technology of the camera and what the film stocks could achieve and what lenses could achieve, but he was also trying to really push the boundaries of the art of cinematography itself. And he knew and experienced greatly that with most directors and most productions, he wasn't going to be allowed to do that. He was going to have the, you know, be put back on the rails and have to do the same thing that you were supposed to do. It was only in certain instances, particularly with John Ford on The Long Voyage Home before Citizen Kane, that he got to use his pioneering deep focus technique uh, was nowhere near as developed as it would be on Kane. But the, there are several precursors you can see in certain films that Tolan would do. And that's just one particular example. Ford also was, was one of the ones who was, was uh, welcoming towards Wells. And Wells, of course, famously said that he, the way he studied for making his first film was to watch Stagecoach night after night after night after night after night to figure out how it was made, how it was put together, and to really break it down into individual pieces and segments and use that to learn how movies were made and put together. And that is still one of the great textbook examples of how to understand motion pictures is literally look at Stagecoach because it is that brilliant and Ford was a genius artist and Wells recognized that. So of course you you you, you borrow and steal from the best. That's how that's how all how all great art begins. Of course this was not to last and Citizen Kane was the only picture under this deal or this original deal that was made and produced. And then RKO was able to change the deal to where uh, Wells did not have the same final cut clause in his contract, which is why the Magnificent Ambersons was taken away and butchered, and uh, the, it was a, in an attempt to quote-unquote save it, but uh, really uh, seems 
in some ways vindictively, uh, and uh, the RKO deal finally fell apart after the Mercury Group was able to produce the film Journey into Fear, which is a little seen and little discussed, and was also heavily butchered, and uh, actually exists in two completely different edits with different endings, uh, and is still a film that needs a proper restoration on home video. Um, but that film was 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 pretty well butchered in the final edit, and then Wells was requested by the State Department to go and make the film It's All True, which he was doing while he was uh, literally as soon as he finished shooting Ambersons, and while he was going off in Brazil doing that, it you know was a difficult shoot, but he was achieving getting material for the very segments as a way to um, be a sort of cinematic goodwill ambassador to South America to try and prevent them from going the opposite way in World War II. Uh, But while he was doing this, this was when essentially, uh, again, RKO took things out on Ambersons and Journey into Fear and the deal fell apart and Wells got a a reputation for being difficult. And uh, this is where the notion of uh, first came apparent that People said that he couldn't finish things and that he was unreliable and he spent too much money and so on and so forth. And that really hung around his neck for the rest of his career. And none of them were true, really, because he wasn't. He was extremely frugal. And uh, I think what people may not have realized is is what made Cain so special and why Cain was able to break through in so many areas is, as Wells always put it, youthful ignorance. He didn't know how to do things. He had never made a movie before. None of the Mercury group had. And by bringing them in, he was at least able to have some of his friends and co-workers and and co-conspirators around. And it's this infectious sense of... What can we do with this with this beautiful new toy, as Wells would say, the movies are the greatest electric train set a boy ever had, which is, of course, true. Uh, but it's this youthful ignorance that gives an energy that permeates the film that is also filled with the social progressiveness of the 1930s uh, theater and radio that they were all coming out of. So all of this is infused into this film, which also is perhaps the greatest magic trick ever devised. Wells was very famously a magician and enjoyed doing magic and was a born storyteller. So those factors make the film perhaps the most endlessly fascinating film ever made. It is the film of all films that you never see everything. Every time you see it, you find something else. You could look at an individual scene by itself two or three times And you will find something different because everything is alive and you start realizing once you become more accustomed and you become more knowledgeable about cinematic techniques, particularly in the studio era, you can start to find and look for the little seams of special effects trick shots because the film is one of the heaviest, it's got one of the heaviest uses of special effects in any film. You wouldn't think Citizen Kane is a special effects extravaganza, but it is because Wells realized what you could do with the tools and techniques and it's not just in the visual realm it's in the sound realm too because Kane as a sound mix in terms of its sound design takes the idea of sound recording to a completely different level this is also using the ability to post record dialogue and you know essentially loop dialogue and uses that as an artistic tool to further express what's going on in the scene. So it's not just the visuals, but it's also the sound too. There is not one element of this film that isn't revolutionary. That also goes into the makeup by Maurice Cederman, who himself was not a union member, who was brought on by Wells, who was so impressed by his work, and Cederman has to not just deal with the main character, but all of the main cast of characters and show them and run them through the the wear and tear of age and show them at different points in life. And not just one or two or three, but, you know, more like five or six at least. So you see all the different stages of Uh, of these characters and you have to recognize them and see how their age and experience has worn them down and that is even reflected in the makeup and it's it's just an unbelievable makeup job especially for 1941 when you consider the the tools and the materials that were available and how much more limiting they were 
Uh, but, but like with anything in Kane, all you have to do is compare it to any other film from the same era or particularly the same year or two in its production. There really is nothing quite like it. There are there are some films that have some some of the same elements. Again, T- Greg Toland had already been playing around with deep focus. Uh, there there are the some of the elements of film noir that are, were starting to be defined. Uh, they do appear in Citizen Kane, uh, but they were starting to be defined primarily, ironically, at RKO, where the previous year in 1940, uh, Nicholas Muzuraka had shot Stranger on the Third Floor, which is now considered the true first film noir in a Hollywood studio, uh, which seems to be pretty much on point because that is a a full-on noir nightmare. It even has a great noirish nightmare sequence in the middle of it. Uh, and of course, you have, if you have Peter Lorre skulking around with deep shadows, you're, it's going to be, you're, you're going to think it's a noir. I mean, there's no getting around that. But uh, Kane takes all of these things and adds in Wells' youthful ignorances, again, as he called it, and his desire to just take everything in every department, whether it meant driving the guys crazy with work, uh, but trying to push everything to 200% across the board to get the absolute best out of every department and to get the best out of the underutilized elements. So again, even though it was a lot more work, the, the 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 all the various department heads you know when they're interviewed or when you read about the, the read interviews where they talk about the film and 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 what Wells is trying to do and like again like he's a kid in the candy store and this enthusiasm carries over to every other department so it gets them on board so it becomes a full team effort and they they had a closed set so this was pretty much they would go in and they would just do their thing and everybody had to leave them alone and if the studio brass came in they just stopped and started playing baseball or something you know it's like um so but it's this exuberance that also I think didn't necessarily endear them to others in Hollywood and and this sort of started the the um the the negative stigma that was attached to Wells and and the Mercury group and this all got blown out of the water when uh people realized uh, and once word got out that the primary figure uh, uh, ba- that the film was based on was William Randolph Hearst it wasn't entirely based on Hearst which is a common misconception uh, but it was very much based around the idea of a larger than life media tycoon figure who's uh, who could influence public opinion and with the various real life elements drawn from various uh, tycoons in different industries but it is very plainly obvious that the primary influence and the primary figure Kane was based on is in fact William Randolph Hearst who tried to get the film pulled uh, started smear campaigns refused to publicize the film or any RKO film uh, and the pressure got to such that Louis B. Mayer, on behalf of the other studios, offered RKO the entire production cost of over $800,000 to buy the negative so it could be destroyed. And it is entirely due to Chief Head George Schaefer uh, and his his backbone to stand up to all of this and insist that the film had to be released, uh, which it was. It was a compromised release because it could only be shown in RKO theaters, which meant it never had chances of great success. It was also the the marketing campaign was was okay, but it was not the greatest. So that didn't help it. And it just never grew the the legs it needed to make it out nationwide. And Hearst pretty much was able to kill the film's chances at success. Uh, It was, you know, immediately hailed as the the triumph and just lightning bolt in the cinematic world uh, by critics on its release but it would take many years for its reputation to sort of work its way out so it's really not until the RKO library was sold to television and the film started popping up on TV airings in the 50s and then also its 1950s theatrical reissues when you can actually see it in a theater that more people discover it. It was shown and released to an entire new generation, and this is when it finally started appearing on the sight and sound polls, and the the word of mouth started to build. 
and it, it essentially became a cult film before that was even a thing, and then it became mainstream, and then it all got solidified over time. So uh, eventually the, the film did get the level of success that it deserved, but it was very much a, a cult film experience in terms of it becoming a cult film and uh, developing over time. Of course, it's impossible to say everything that you, you want to about Citizen Kane. There's so much that's already been said and been written and been published, and it, so, so much that's out there in video form as well about the film that, it, again, it, it's hard to find things that haven't been said, but it is still to this day it is such an experience on an intellectual level on an emotional level the ending is still a gut punch that will never fade uh it is one of the great dramas it is but it's it's greatest and most lasting impact is for those of us who are either in the motion picture industry or aspire to be in the industry or who know how films are put together, know how films are made, because it is like a magician. It, it is like it, it's constantly doing a vanishing act. It's always drawing the eye to places. It's always entertaining. But when, when, you, when you're sort of in on the joke, when you can see behind the curtain, you want to literally jump behind the curtain. You are so fascinated that you, and you're so drawn in that you want to know more. And it is, in that sense, like the endless jigsaw puzzles put together by Susan Alexander Kane, famously in Xanadu. The film itself is a puzzle. It's a puzzle you're always trying to put together, and you'll never be able to finish it because it always holds elements back and allows you to discover them over time. You're always finding another puzzle piece. It's like a puzzle box that has secret drawers and secret pieces inside, and just when you think you've got it solved, there's another facet that you never saw or you, were, you never even considered before. And it's this that keeps the film both timeless and forever alive. And that ties into that energy that is just infused into every single frame. This is the creative mind, the creative spirit uh, laid bare in motion picture form with the entire creative force of the Mercury units from their legendary Mercury Theater in, on Broadway and the legendary Mercury Theater on the air, uh, the, 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 the contribution of Orson Welles to not just theater, but particularly in the radio realm, is still to this day, I think, one of the most overlooked and most underrated and most undervalued artist's contribution uh, to an entire medium uh, because radio itself is so ignored and undervalued and not talked about because it is of a different era. But to understand Citizen Kane, you have to understand what the Mercury did on both stage and in radio because all of that is brought into the film. Uh, so is all of the ideas that Wells had when he was trying to develop his first uh, features at RKO and nothing was getting off the ground. So if you read about the almost main version of Heart of Darkness, a lot of those ideas do make it over into Kane, right? Down to the subjective first person camera turning up again in Citizen Kane, but this time a, a bit simplified, but in the form of Mr. Thompson, the reporter, who is always unseen. And that's sort of a, a, uh, a person representing or a figure representing that idea of the first person viewpoint camera that Wells was so in love with uh, when he was trying to make Heart of Darkness. Uh, there again, the film is endlessly fascinating. That uh, you never want to stop uh, researching it. I've read countless books on Wells, as is obvious. Uh, there are many books uh, with Kane sections. There are great books about Kane. I do highly recommend Harlan Lebo's uh, Citizen Kane: A Filmmaker's Journey, which is an updated version of the book in the old 50th anniversary box and it just had a new updated version uh, published this year i believe or this past year uh, which i really want to check out because i've only read the uh, previous versions uh, but that that i think is the best book on Kane as a standalone uh, but even all of those with, with all the great research 
research that's been done, it's still never enough. Uh, just like in this Criterion release, with over two discs of special features, it's only scratching the surface. It's, it's still not enough. Uh, you can never know too much about Kane. And again, to look at the elements that make up the film, every aspect is life-changing and revolutionary and so full of energy and so awe-inspiringly amazing that it is among the greatest in its field. So again, this is every facet of Kane. It's not just that it could be the greatest film ever made if you want to give it that label. It's also containing some of the greatest performances you'll ever see in a motion picture, performances that transcend what's on the page and transcend mere actors playing a role, but they become figures you think of in life that are so identified with uh, morals and uh, certain ways of looking at things. So uh, some of the dialogue become uh, just general sayings you can apply to your everyday life uh that just you, you could take almost any line from Cain and you could be able to quote it endlessly uh, so many things in Cain that are, that are said are like proverbs so you can look at these characters and they they feel like real historical individuals that actually existed so it, they're, they're they're not just it's not just Everett Sloan as Mr. Bernstein Mr. Bernstein himself becomes a real type of person just as uh, Joseph Cotton as Jedediah Leland Jed Leland becomes a particular individual with a certain ideology uh, it, it, it just extends to everyone and for the Mercury players for the most part, these were their first motion picture performances, which is just astounding. And on top of that, in Maurice Cederman's incredible makeup uh, and being photographed by Greg Toland in the extraordinarily intricate deep focus technique. So it's not like any of this was, oh, we're just going to do something simple because it's your first time. No, uh, it's just it, it is not. And the fact that all of this is carried off effortlessly with a plum and becomes iconic is is astounding and people talk about this being wells's first first picture he made and he was only 25 and he was the boy wonder uh well he was a boy wonder ever since he was born he was a boy wonder but it's not just the fact that wells was 25 it and had this amazing contract he had his friends of the Mercury, he had a whole team surrounding him, and he had an entire studio of all the various departments behind him, and he was able to unify and unite everyone on a common front to make the best possible picture that they could make, which they did. And this was something that could have been repeated uh, and and was on Ambersons before it was destroyed. Uh, I mean, we still have the theatrical version that survives, but uh, the the impact is so diluted. But it would have been uh, it was it's a different film, obviously, with a different tone, but. It, it was never a case of, of Wells overspending or not being able to finish projects or being too distracted, as so many people have tried to claim. Uh, it, 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 this go, but this is a, a, one of the many lessons to learn from Kane. It's not all positive stuff. It's the fact that uh, the making of motion pictures is a team effort, and it's not just one person. It is an entire group, and when all the departments in the studio system could be united like this, uh, this didn't happen all the time. And that's another thing that makes Kane so unique and so special. You have 25-year-old Orson Welles co-writing the film, co-producing the film, <laughs> directing the film, and starring in the film in one of the most difficult roles that has ever been developed for a motion picture because Kane himself is an enigma. Uh, he also has to go through the different stages of aging and the the different sides of his personality that emerge or get submerged over time. It's an incredibly nuanced, detailed performance, just like everyone else in the film. And Wells does it, and it's just effortless and just like every other character in the film Kane himself becomes so burned into your brain you feel like you're watching the rise and fall of a real person 
Uh, it's astounding that he did all of this and did it all at the same time at the age he was. And as, as he claimed again, you know, <laughs> youthful ignorance, uh, youthful ignorance helps quite a lot, uh, but it's, it goes down the line. The writing of the film uh, by Herman Mankiewicz and Orson Welles because it was co-written. That's a point that really does bug me. It didn't really get brought up until Polly and Kale's hatchet job, Raising Cain, which is one of the f biggest pieces of filth that has ever been written. And I'm not saying that just because I'm a giant fan of Wells, but uh, it was literally just designed to take auteur theory down a peg and was not backed up by any sort of research whatsoever. Uh, the film was co-written. It is very plainly obvious, and the, the facts are readily available. And had the film been shot as the original Herman Mankiewicz draft, or one of his later drafts that he wrote, uh, it would not be the Citizen Kane that we know and adore, and it would not be the magical film that it is. It was their collaboration, and Wells using his in, in, incredible skills of not just story construction, but also ad adaptation because of uh, the incredible skill that he had already displayed at adapting uh, long novels for radio and also for the stage in terms of uh, his inherent sense of dramatization. So if you do some digging into the construction of the script, it is a wonderful back and forth uh, collaboration between two rather similar in ways individuals who were otherwise at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Mankiewicz was an industry veteran who was friendly with Hearst and had spent many weekends as a party guest at San Simeon, so this was seen as sort of a personal attack on the Hearst. But anyway, the, the script itself is uh, just, it's one that you must study. It is unbelievably complex but also extraordinarily easy to understand which is why the film is so endlessly rewatchable that uh, it's non-traditional, non-linear uh, method of storytelling is so digestible. And to be able to achieve that in, in you know in a two-hour movie runtime is incredibly difficult. And so it is It is the collaboration and the way that Herman Mankiewicz and Orson Welles sparked off of each other, also with some very important contributions from Welles' producing partner from the Mercury Theater days, John Houseman. Uh, it, it is a, a singular work that has an identity of its own, but also is sort of charged by that youthful energy and that exuberance that permeates every, every aspect of the film. But uh, again, the notion of it of it being entirely uh, written by one person is is not not factual, and uh, it, I really hate that that continually gets spread around. So again, when you look further at all of the elements that make up the film, the production design of Kane is still astounding. It is not. A super expensive film but it looks like it and the production design and the sets uh are just i, I mean perry ferguson was was the primary figure uh behind this and i i mean i still it is astounding to see what he was able to achieve on the RKO lot, again, with a budget that wasn't the greatest. So there are even some sets that are literally reused from other films, one of them being the El Rancho Nightclub, where Susan Alexander Kane gives her interview. Uh, and the, it's just astounding how how alive and and real that the settings feel i mean xanadu itself is a real place that lives and breathes in all of our minds those of us who've seen citizen kane and to know know that it's not real <laughs> you know it's just sort of it sort of breaks your heart because it feels like such a real vivid place and uh, a place that itself would be haunted by uh, the 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 spirits of those who who lived in there and and it's just a an incredible uh, and very oppressive and very gothic uh, visual interior and that it it feels like it it must be a real place like they went to some oversized gigantic 
historical estate and and shot the film in there i mean it's just astounding what they're able to do and of course the film's most famous for having visible ceilings which was a real novelty at the time it is not the first film to have visible ceilings of course but of course in the early sound era they would put started putting the microphones on boom poles or would hang them from the studio ceiling so obviously you wouldn't show the ceiling because there wasn't one because there were the microphones above the actors heads and so to achieve the visual effects and the uh, the low angle shots that Wells so favored with Greg Toland you had to have a ceiling up there and you had to work with the sound department to change the microphone placements. And also that means that the sets themselves could be more oppressive and more restrictive to the actors and the visuals because of the ceiling being at a certain height. That means it's automatically lower than what you have in most other films without ceilings. And then in other sets, they actually lowered where the ceiling would be to make it even more oppressive. So it's like everyone's getting boxed in further and then it, the opposite happens in the grand rooms of Xanadu where it's all big and open or in other spaces where the space itself is designed to serve the story. Every element of Citizen Kane serves the story in that particular moment because everything is working in unison. This, again, goes into the sound department, which uh, James G. Stewart was the re-recording engineer who worked on countless films and was never, uh, before this point or rarely afterwards, asked to push the art of sound mixing to such a degree to really elevate it into the art form that it is as opposed to just making sure the sound and picture are in synchronization. Uh, it, it is... It's a film you can listen to completely on its own. You can turn your visual, you can turn the visuals off and listen to the soundtrack itself and you still get the entirety of the film because it feels like it has the energy of a radio drama and the sound itself gives so much to the visuals but itself is still a vivid and alive thing. Everything is there in the soundtrack, just as it is in the visuals. You can separate the two. You can look at the visuals alone as if it was a silent film, and you can still get all the necessary information, just as with the soundtrack. You can listen to not just the dialogue, not just the performances and the way the music is spotted, but the the way the sound effects are utilized to a far more intricate degree than they are in most of the films of this era, but also the way that the voices are recorded and played around with, where natural echo is added, where emphasis is added to make it feel as if you're really there and the voices will be... Uh, modulated and also mixed to perfectly match what the characters are doing on screen at that time. So the sound itself be, is is a complete experience and it's a fascinating thing to do. I've done this myself. I highly recommend it. If you look at Citizen Kane, you can take any scene and you can turn the sound off and look at the visuals and look at the storytelling but then I highly encourage everyone to take that same scene or any scene or the whole film if you want to and just listen to the soundtrack and just marvel at how astoundingly and very intricately crafted that the soundtrack is. Uh, again, it is one of the best sound design jobs of any film that has ever been done. And all of this ties in to the intricate knowledge of the radio medium that Wells and the Mercury Group had. And all of this was brought into the motion picture media. And it's something that Wells never forgot. Uh, all, all Orson Wells productions, all the films he directed, all the films he made, have an intricate knowledge of the way that sound performs in dramatic storytelling. So again, there is no aspect of Kane that doesn't have magic and an elevating of the entire field uh, of that particular element of motion picture making. There is not one stone that Susan Kane leaves unturned. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Bernard Herrmann's incredibly achingly beautiful score that is so blisteringly dark and yet so blisteringly full of life and vigor and intelligence and creativity. Uh, it is 
Herman stepping out of the radio field and firmly jumping over into the motion picture realm. Uh, this is the, the the one of the most, again, intricately crafted film scores there is, and it is one of Herman's legendary scores, of course, being one of the greatest composers who ever lived. And I say that not just as saying that Herman was one of the greatest film composers, but I think he was one of the greatest musical composers and musical minds that has ever existed. Uh, but Kane is very frequently, if you look at its design, uh, and Herman admit, admitted this in interviews uh, very, very freely, it is scored in a way that is very similar to what he was doing on radio. He even said that he spotted it, uh, literally calling them musical spots instead of cues like you would have in a normal film score, that he spotted it with the particular musical uh, sections and pieces like he would uh, have done on the radio. And also it allowed him to uh, have his creativity run full force. I think the greatest example of this is the opera that Susan Alexander Kane is, is performing is a custom written opera by Herman, who was able to create this entire piece that perfectly sets the mood and tone. And on top of that, the soprano voice is purposely uh, raised above uh, in pitch of what most singers could do. So the, the performer is already having to sing out of her range to fully underline the, uh, the, the, the crucial moment for, for the Susan Cain character at that point in her disastrous opera debut. Uh, again, there is not one part of the film that doesn't serve the story, the characters, and the individual scenes that are being told at that time. Everything works in unison. I said before, Citizen Kane is one of the most heavily laden special effects films of all time, which is absolutely true, but they are so beautifully interwoven and so meticulously placed and designed, and it is entirely due to the extreme talents of the RKO effects department, uh, who had, of course, pioneered a lot of techniques in 1933's King Kong, but it was especially Linwood Dunn and his incredible mastery of the optical printer uh, that allowed for many of the what were seemingly off-the-wall, kooky, crazy, insane ideas that Wells would come up with once he discovered what the optical printer was and what it could do uh, he was always coming up with, oh, well, we can just do this in the optical printer. We can do this. And then, you know, he would have to be told that, you know, <laughs> well, that's not how it's normally done. And then Dunn would have to come up with ways to figure out how to get on camera and physically get what Wells wanted and apply all of his incredible effects know-how that you see uh, in all kinds of RKO films. Uh, a, a great example being the incredible, uh, almost completely invisible effects work in bringing up baby when uh the baby the leopard gets um, a, a, a bit more active in the film shall we say uh, he had been uh, doing this work for some time like all of the people in the RKO departments but it, it was Kane and, and Wells asking everyone to do all these crazy things and inspiring them to then try and do them that got everybody so active and on board. Again, it makes every department a unified front. Everyone's fighting for the same goal. Everyone's engaged and you're not doing the same things over and over again on a normal film. This is something different. This is something that allows you to be creative and feel like you're contributing something. So, to look at Citizen Kane is also important for a special effects perspective because you can go through shot for shot and find all of these little hidden things that you wouldn't normally notice. But when you go looking for them, it's not a matter of, oh, that's a mistake because you can see the matte line or it's an optical shot and because you have this. And it's not, it's not a reason to go like, oh, no, the illusion is ruined. No, it's a reason to celebrate because you can find you can find the little hidden seams and discover oh well that's how they did that or I didn't even realize it was a mat shot or I didn't realize that was a traveling mat shot 
and it becomes even more fascinating and it enriches your viewing experience because again it's that idea of you're getting to see behind the curtain you're getting to see how things are made and put together and it encourages you to then apply that in your own life especially if you are aspiring to get into the motion picture industry this is why more people have been inspired to get into motion picture making by citizen kane alone than any other film ever made again i think the film's greatest legacy and the reason why it's timeless is that particular factor the fact that it's always engaging it's always exciting and it's not just fun it's not just enriching but it's also encouraging it's so encouraging, and that is is the ultimate reason why I think you, you can't stop looking for new things, and you can't stop researching the film, and you can't stop looking more closely at it and trying to take it apart and figure out how, how things were done and how, how certain effects were achieved and, and how certain scenes were achieved, and I think the 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 biggest i saved for last of course you have to talk about the photography of kane what greg toland brought was his entire incredible background as a master of of motion picture photography but somebody who was really chafing under the constraints of the Hollywood studio system he was somebody who wanted to push boundaries and was like everyone at the time was held back by technical limitations by the speed of the film stocks by the lenses that were available by the cameras that were available uh, after the 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 talkie revolution the ability to move cameras had been severely limited so it had to basically be redone again from scratch to try and approach the moving camera techniques that were available in the silent film era but it was at select points, as I've alluded to before, where Greg Tolan was able to sort of, if you will, flex his muscles and stretch out a little bit and apply some of his uh, theories and techniques that he really wanted to push. He couldn't do this all the time because it depended on the producer, depended on the director, depended on the studio or who he was making films for. Uh, he eventually signed with Samuel Goldwyn, so he was you know, doing Goldwyn films, and this was a loan out to RKO expressly for Citizen Kane. I think one of the greatest... Uh, greatest shames in all of motion pictures is the fact that uh, Toland and Wells were never able to make another film together again because their relationship became so simpatico. Toland literally came to Wells and said, as I said before, I want to make this picture for you because you don't know what you're doing. And this meant that Toland would be able to do all the things he always wanted to do with somebody who was game to try them because he didn't know what the rules were and he wouldn't be afraid about breaking rules. And they were simpatico in the idea that they both wanted to do new and important things. It was Tolan's humility and patience and encouragement that allowed Wells to fly freely and make what is considered the greatest picture ever made. Uh, not everybody would have done that. Uh, and I, again, I think that Greg Toland recognized something in Wells that uh, probably reminded him a bit of himself. And Toland had gotten to experiment with what we now call deep focus photography of being able to keep multiple planes in focus in a shot at the same time and get a ridiculous depth of field. Uh, he had been able to do this primarily with John Ford, who himself was already a visual master. Uh, but you see it most of all in the film they, that they made together shortly before Citizen Kane, 1940's The Long Voyage Home. I can't express enough how important visually that film is to Citizen Kane in terms of learning where these techniques came from. And it is such an, a powerful visual experience that I encourage everyone who is a fan of Kane or hasn't seen Long Voyage Home, please do yourself a favor and go and look at the John Ford picture of The Long Voyage Home that Greg Tolan shot because you will see a lot of what you see in Kane, but you know, modulated a little bit differently. It's like a it's like a version 1.0. It's it's a it's like a demo version in some ways of the deep focus photography development in Kane. 
The other difference is came was shot with a faster film stock. The uh, I believe it was called the Super XX uh, from Kodak, if I'm remembering the name correctly. But it was a faster film stock that allowed uh, for greater performance because to get the deep focus technique, Toland had to stop the, the camera down really, really low and use incredible extra amounts of light, which meant that you had to design your shots and design the set uh, around those constraints. You had to worry about how the costumes would look, have to worry about how the makeup would look. So again, everything had to be in unison for this stuff to work. And again, another reason why the visible ceilings were so important and necessary is because of the incredible usage of low angles throughout the film, which are not done just as, a, oh, hey, wouldn't it be cool if... No, they are all done for dramatic purpose. They are all saved for incredibly dramatic moments and help to show the figures in the film as both larger than life and also as uh, being diminished in an interesting way. So again, the visuals tell the story. So again, you can watch Citizen Kane without any sound just by visuals alone, and you still get the same incredible story impact. Obviously, you don't have the dialogue, and it is limited in that way, yes, but as an experiment, you can do that, and the visuals themselves still maintain that incredible sense of power. Some of the key examples of, of the power of Tolan's work on, on Kane and the power of the visuals are, of course, the great examples of the deep focus technique. And those are especially in moments where you have figures moving back and forth within the frame and the perspective stays the same. Uh, the great moment where Kane signs away a, his fortune and then gets up from the table, walks away from Thatcher and Bernstein and walks over to what seems like the window's off in the distance, uh, and he becomes a smaller figure. When he gets to the end, and he's standing under the windows, you realize the windows must be like 10 or 15 feet tall. And then as he walks back towards the table, still remaining in focus the entire time, with Bernstein and Thatcher in the extreme foreground still in focus the whole time, he walks back to the table, and as he comes back, you know, he goes from being a small figure and then when he gets to the table, he is the looming large figure of Cain once more. He still has his power and prestige, but he has been severely hurt by having to sign away most of his fortune. This is the ma another major turning point in his life, but he, st he still has that grandeur, that physical sense. And even though he then sits back down at the table, it is that incredible visual signifier of what's happening in this moment in Kane's life when he does that. Uh, there's a similar scene in Xanadu late in the film where that happens again, where there's a sort of optical illusion where Kane walks towards the grand fireplace in the Grand Hall of Xanadu and as he's talking, and then he walks up to it, and then when he gets to it, he almost sort of fits under it, so you realize the fireplace is even bigger than you thought. It must be like eight or nine feet tall and just massive, and then when Kane walks away from it, again, it's that amazing uh, deep focus, but it also gives you this optical illusion effect that also helps you to become further fascinated and these are the things you look at over and over and over again when you're trying to figure out how these things were achieved uh it's also in the but it's not just all about deep focus it's also the uh, the the way that uh wells would hold scenes the way that things are played out in one that there are less cutaways there are less close-ups used uh the key example being the boarding house scene when uh, young kane is given up to the bank to be raised sent off to boarding school the majority of that entire sequence inside the house is an entire single take and a tracking shot through the house in deep focus and when we have the reverse in the interior and we're seeing all the way through to the window and out the window where young charlie kane is playing out in the snow and of course shouting the union forever as the union is being destroyed forever inside between his parents and himself uh we we have that all in focus and then when the camera pulls back we're going all through the house and this is all still one take as dialogue is being said as ta as the table is being moved into place and moved out of the way for the camera again you don't notice this stuff but 
when you're watching the film, all of this adds an energy that adds to the energy of the scene. Because again, like I've said before, everything is unified in its attack on the material. This also has to be said for the film's editing, which is effortless, invisible, and keeps with the rhythms of the film perfectly. So it, it, it remains one of the greatest edited films of all time. Uh, this was edited by the young Robert Wise, who was a contract editor at RKO. This is before he launched his own legendary directing career that really began uh, once he graduated over in the Val Luton unit after Wells left RKO. In the, uh, so this would be later on in the 1940s. Uh, but Wise was able to realize the things Wells was trying to do and what Wells wanted in the cutting room. And he was able to translate that into the actual realm of editing. So once again, every aspect of the film is unified and charged with this can-do energy. Everything has a can-do attitude, uh, just like the previous Mercury Theater productions on both stage and radio. So there, there's a synergy there that puts everyone on a common front. Everyone had the same goal to achieve something new and different, which they did, which is why Citizen Kane is timeless, effortless, and never ceases to amaze and always has something more to reveal, something new to discover, and never fails to make you feel as if you have witnessed something and you've been a part of something again. Whether you've seen it one time, five times, ten times, a hundred times, it doesn't matter. Citizen Kane is a unique experience in the cinematic medium. There is no other film like it. There will never be another film like it. And if any film had to be labeled as the greatest film ever made, Citizen Kane is is perhaps the uh, the greatest possible recipient of that type of honor because it not only has everything from romance to drama to even some slight bits of action and great humor and great heart, but also every aspect of motion picture production is pushed to its absolute limit. Every aspect of motion picture production is at its creative peak because everyone was encouraged to do that and they delivered in spades and the film is fully unified in all aspects as a true, incredible, complete experience that shows you exactly what a movie can be and what a movie should be and what a movie is supposed to be. So now we come to the Criterion Blu-ray UHD Combo Pack Deluxe release, Their Spine 1104. So let's go ahead and get the elephant out of the room and talk about the art and packaging design, which has been discussed pretty much ad nauseum since the first uh, the, the cover art first appeared before the release. But uh, there is so much to talk about here. So the, the art is striking. It does take some getting used to. It is very simplistic, and I, I like it for what it is. It's not necessarily what I would have chosen for the art, but Criterion does like to have... Uh, for the most part on, on their releases, a very arty statement making type of uh, cover design. And this both mimics and makes you think of the giant K on the gates of Xanadu and the type font type that is used is uh, reminiscent of the film's main title. And also Citizen Kane on the side being printed makes you think of the information that would be printed on uh, on you know actual photographs. So I I mean I I get it, and we have the classic Criterion C logos. Uh, you know that it's it is what it is, and I've I've gotten used to it. I will admit, but at first it was a little jarring. Uh, then the spine looks quite nice with the Citizen Kane font there, and then we have the rear with the large list of all the extra features. So that is pretty much uh, what you would expect on a modern Criterion release. Now, this is where we get into territory that is still a bit infuriating. So, um, and this has been very much discussed, but I just, I, 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 the, every time I handle this or I pick this up, it just, I, I start complaining again. So this is a slipcase design and it is a rather heavy uh, foldout inside. So it will, it does want to slide out a lot, but also 
the actual dimensions are a little bit skewed there, as you can see. And no matter what you do, it is very hard to get the uh, the fold out digipack inside in and out very you have to be very careful but no matter what you do you're still going to scuff some of the corners so as you can see uh, because of this design when i got this it already had the little scuffed torn edge and that gets exacerbated by trying to take out the um, take the slip cover on and off so you do have to be very careful with that to begin with and once it's off you can see it's a little, a little slightly skewed to one side. So another thing is when you get this, or if you're looking at it in a store, or if you order it online, you get it, you pick it up, and you feel something, I don't know if you can hear that, but you hear something rattling around, and you'll think that it's a floater disc inside, and that you need to worry about uh, scratch disc that you'll have to replace. But no, that's actually the booklet uh, flopping around inside. So you don't have to worry about it being floater disc. Now, this is the, I think now you can say, notorious fold-out package design. They did try to go something for something fancy, which is appropriate for Kane, and I understand that, and I get the idea of it. Uh, spine is the same. The rear has the rosebud insignia, which is nice. But this is where things go way um, off the rails, and um, this is just, this was a terrible idea. So we have the K, then you open like you would a normal fold out, then we get the A. So there are no disc hubs, the discs are slotted into the sleeves, and it is rather difficult getting out the main ones because they are an interior pocket. Also, the discs are very easy to scratch with your fingers getting them out. It's also going to get scratched up in these pockets. Uh, it is a terrible idea to ever put discs in cardboard sleeves or pockets like this. I don't know why Criterion started doing designs like this. All we need is a proper case uh, or a digipack fold out with actual disc hubs. So um, Criterion is now doing this like a lot of major studios do with their box sets. This is always a bad idea. The number one thing you should do is protect the discs inside. Uh, this is not the worst in terms of the disc slots, but it's already not a good idea and in terms of getting discs in and out, it is very difficult with this panel. Now, when you have this, you then have to open it. And this, forgive me, this is very difficult to do on camera and hold this up. So then you open to show the end of Kane. It is nice seeing the different stages of Kane and the different parts of his life. Now, already you see this is a little unwieldy. And then we have to open the flap upwards to get the E. We have Kane in his triumphant uh, political speech. And then if that wasn't enough, you have to fold down... And then we get young cane. I do apologize for the glare. So we have this four corners design. And as you see, I'm holding my fingers because I have to hold the booklet in place. Because if you open this and you're just going to flop it out like so, the booklet's going to go flying out. So the booklet is just sitting inside there. And in the interior, we have a shot of the famous snow globe. So we have this sort of quad fold design if you will another problem is that the discs are in these slots but on the top and bottom they're so loosely in there especially this one it very easily slides out so i've actually had this and opened it to uh, pull out one of the extras discs and before i knew it the actual disc went flying out so um it's going to fly out of the top and bottom but the sides for the feature discs are much harder to get at the 4K disc over here is is okay, but this one over here for the Blu-ray disc is exceptionally difficult, difficult to get out. And the only way you can get it out is to completely unfold the package like this and remove the booklet. Because especially with the booklet in place, you can't access it perfectly because the booklet is thicker than normal. So as you can see there, you're already having to do that. And no matter what you do, you're going to get your fingerprints on the disc surface it's just, it's a terrible idea and it's also very easy to scratch the actual blu-ray itself this is the packaging everybody's been talking about and complaining about i don't know why somebody thought this was a good idea 
until you get it in your hands and you play around with it yourself and you're having to get the discs in and out a lot when you watch all the extras because there's so many extras you can't do it all in one sitting obviously the more you handle this and the more you have to physically take discs in and out the more you absolutely hate this again i i get the idea I get they wanted to do something special. I get that this is unique packaging. Yes, it sure as heck is unique. But this is appalling. I, 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 I have to say it. The more I've handled this, the more I have come to really become sick of this design. I hope they never use this again. I, I think what I'm going to do is actually just get a standalone case and put the discs in it. Uh, so that way I don't risk further damaging this because as you can see, there's some creasing in the actual, let's see if I can get this to show up on camera, but there is some creasing on the corners and it's starting to get more wear. That also comes from it getting kicked around in shipping and also the, the slip case itself getting some damage. This is an infuriating package design. I absolutely think, th I mean, I'll just go ahead and say it. I think this deserves a place in the home video packaging hall of shame list uh, in terms of just being a terrible design, a terrible layout, and you will risk damaging things. You can only get things out if you completely unfold it. It's unwieldy, it flops around. And most of all, you're going to get scratches on your discs. You're going to get discs that become damaged. And you have discs that are difficult to get out, but then you have, difficult, you have difficulty keeping other discs in. Again, especially this bottom panel. If you're not careful, uh, and as careful as I was, I opened it once, and sure enough, the extras disc just went flying out. And at first, I thought I had uh, you know, scratched it up really bad or something because it just I couldn't even catch it because it just went... Whoosh, um, so yeah, again, it doesn't look so bad until you start trying to use it yourself. I mean, I, I again, I, I can't say it enough that I I I ha I would put this on the the worst uh, home video packagings of all time, regardless of format. That is how unwieldy and goofy and stupid this is. Again, I think stupid is a good word. I don't fault Criterion for trying to come up with something special and new and different for Kane. Again, that makes sense, but I, I wish somebody had uh, looked at a pre-production copy of this and said, hey, this is really stupid. This, this ain't going to work. Um, but ever since they started doing their, their big box sets, uh, they have moved away from having a proper case for titles, and I think that's a giant mistake because I think the big drawback of, of the Criterion big boxes like the Fellini box and the Bergman box is the fact that the discs are not properly protected and they're not given proper disc hubs and cases. Uh, so this, th But this... This takes the design to another level in terms of the problematic usage. Yes, it's very cool. Yes, you get the different stages of cane. That's great. Just give me a standard case. That would have been fine. <laughs> you know, even if you made it black or something special. Um, yeah, this is this is appalling that 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 is that it is appalling packaging. So again, I think this is one of the worst home video package designs I have ever experienced, regardless of format. It is it is a pain. It is a chore. You you're you you get you get wear and tear on the package itself. You have to fully open it. You're going to scratch your discs up again. It just please don't ever do this again, Criterion. Again, I get that you wanted to do something different, but this is a bad idea. Another thing is when you go to fold it, you have to do it in order. It's very easy to forget. So you go like this and you start to, oh, oh, nope, nope, nope. It's gotta be top first. And then you have to fold it back in. But as you see, I didn't put the booklet in there. So without the booklet flopping around, you don't have that sort of floater effect, but it also feels a little hollow because the booklet actually, because it's thicker, helps to sort of pad things out a little bit when it's all folded up. Again, the booklet itself is quite nice. It is a little thicker. So we get Xanadu on the front. And then as a nice touch, the opening end papers are the film's real Citizen Kane title card. The image choices, as usual for Criterion, are perfectly on point. Uh, the booklet essay is pretty good uh, by uh, Bill Jabiri. I'm butchering that pronunciation. I do apologize, but I'm not sure how you pronounce how you pronounce the name. 
Uh, you get your casting credits list and, of course, the restoration notes. So to read the restoration notes, this will lead me into talking about the transfer and the technical specs. Uh, I do this because it's really important on Kane to understand what the sources are that they're having to work with because there is no surviving original camera negative. So the uh, restoration notes go, uh, and again, I abbreviate these so I don't just, just read the whole blurb. <laughs> because the original negative no longer exists, this restoration undertaken by Criterion draws primarily from a 35mm nitrate composite fine grain master made from the original negative in 1941. So already we are one generation away from the original negative to start with. Some sequences where the primary element had sustained damage were replaced using a 35mm duplicate negative struck from the nitrate fine grain master itself in 1941. So that's another generation away for the second source. Both film elements were scanned in 16-bit 4K resolution on a Laser Graphics Director film scanner using high-density scanning and 3-flash HDR in order to retrieve the greatest amount of detail from the dense nitrate element. A 35mm print from the collection of the Academy Archive at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences was used as a color grading reference in this restoration with additional reference to the 2010 Warner Brothers restoration work uh, whose grading was based on the same reference print, essentially meaning what turned up on on the Warner Brothers Blu-ray in 2011. On the 4K disc, the feature is presented with Dolby Vision HDR grading. On the Blu-ray, it is presented in high-definition SDR, standard dynamic range. For restoration of the original monaural soundtrack, the bilateral variable area optical tracks from both the nitrate fine grain master and the duplicate negative were transferred at Deluxe Sound in Hollywood using the COSP system. The cleanest surviving sections of the two elements were selected and compiled into a single track. After 80 years, the physical damage to the optical tracks was substantial, manifesting as audible pops, clicks, dropouts, and other distortions. These artifacts were digitally mitigated on a case-by-case -case basis with every effort made to preserve the character of the original production. And then it goes on to give the credits for the uh, restorers at Criterion and also for Warner Brothers MPI division handling the 4K scanning of the elements. And then in a great touch, the back of the booklet has the actual title card from the uh, News on the March newsreel. So those technical notes give you an idea of what they were having to work with and the, uh, the actual restoration and then what they had to work with to present on disc. Now, of course, it is very well known now that the original release, which I have, uh, had a defective Blu-ray disc, which about 20 or 30 minutes in, there was a complete uh, screw-up where the image went totally bad as a result of an error in the HDR to SDR conversion process. As far as I can tell, uh, that meant the image suddenly went really dark and went uh, very... Uh, it's, it's hard to describe, but basically it went dark and it suddenly looked flat, like it had been flattened out, and there was obviously something that was horribly wrong. Uh, thankfully, Criterion caught on to this immediately after people started saying something, uh, literally as the disc was coming out, and then there was difficulty in purchasing copies, and they came up with their uh, replacement program where you had to either mail in or destroy your defective disc and send a photo with your email address. Um, I... Never have really destroyed a disc before, but I, I wound up doing it uh, and then uh, eventually got my replacement disc not too terribly long ago. So it took it took about three months, really. Uh, so it, I wish it hadn't taken so long, but, um, you know, at least they were they were very good about it. And, you know, we didn't have to pay anything if if, uh, you know, if you did the email variety, if you mailed the disc in, you obviously have to pay for mailing the disc in. Uh, and they also gave a, gave a $10 off coupon for those of us who purchased the defective release uh, for the Criterion website store. So that, 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 was a, that was a nice thing. They didn't have to do that. So even though it did take a little bit of time, they at least were able to correct the issue. And the current uh, corrected Blu-ray is perfectly fine as it should be. And all new copies are with the corrected Blu-ray disc. If you happen to purchase a copy and it goes bad in 20 minutes on the 1080p Blu-ray disc, you do have the defective copy and you can go through the same process. So um, I, I don't think too many copies are floating around out there because uh, they did pull them from store shelves, but it is possible. So again, those who purchase this set new, just make sure that uh, your Blu-ray disc is fine. And this also did affect the non-UHD Blu-ray only releases as well. So you do want 
want to immediately pop the feature disc in and watch it as soon as possible or just fast forward through it if you don't have the time to check and make sure that you have the corrected disc. And again, you will be very, uh, it's very easy to tell because about 20 or 30 minutes in, all of a sudden everything goes wrong. So uh, do do check that uh, immediately if you purchase a set new uh, because again, it is possible you might have gotten one of the original pressings with the defective Blu-ray disc inside. Now let's talk about the picture transfer. First of all, I, I do have to readily admit, I unfortunately don't have a 4K setup as of yet. I have been trying to wait for the technology to uh, stop improving because it seems like they keep coming out with better panels and so on and so forth. Uh, but as soon as I finally do jump into 4K, I will add an update with my direct thoughts on the 4K presentation on the UHD itself. But since this is already a limited source, uh, the, the upgrade factors in the UHD are already limited compared to the 1080p release here. And there have been a lot of people who have purchased this release and thought that it wasn't worth 4K or that there wasn't much improvement or that the Blu-ray itself was not much of an improvement over the original 2011 Warner Brothers Blu-ray. The improvements here are quite substantial in both picture and sound, but they are going to be less obvious to people who don't know a lot about 1940s films or who are not as familiar with Citizen Kane as those of us who have grown up with the film and seen it countless times. The improvements here are not in the usual obvious things like the uptick in resolution, which there is obviously some slight uh, a bit of that when you go from 1080p to 4K, but because of the limited sources, it is marginal compared to what it can be. The impact and the difference and the improvements are in the more subtle areas. Citizen Kane itself is a hard film to transfer due to the very intricate deep focus photography of Greg Toland. And because of that, combined with the fact that they're not working from original camera negative, it's going to have a particular look to it when done right. It's never going to look like any other film from 1941 or from the studio era, and it's never going to look like any other film, period. There have been a variety of different approaches to the film on video in the past, and for my money, this is the absolute best the film has looked on home video, period, even just talking about the 1080p version, because the major uh, advancements here are in the grayscale, which is very, very intricate. A lot of earlier releases have sort of flattened that out and they go for various looks or they're working from different elements and they did not have the scanning tools available this time for this particular restoration attempt. So I think the biggest improvements here are in the grayscale, in the presentation of the shadows, the grading of the black and white is far superior to, to what we had on the Warner Brothers Blu-ray. So even though when you put them side by side, and even if you add the 4K into the mix, a lot of people are going to say, oh, well, there, I don't see a difference if, if they just, you know, do a quick glance. And on the surface, they seem pretty similar. It's when you look a bit more closely at them, and it, when, especially when you look at them in motion. But uh, if, if you know about black and white films in the classic studio period and how grayscale is supposed to look. And most of all, if you've ever been able to see a print of Citizen Kane in a theater, which I've been lucky enough to do at an art house screening, uh, it was obviously not an original print, but it was a print made later that still had more of the nuances and the photography visible that were not available on prior video releases. It's not until you see a print that you're able to fully appreciate, again, the, the nuances in the visuals and the photography. And for my money, this new Criterion release is, is, I think, about the best that can be done on home video. And again, I am still only talking about the 1080p disc. I think it is a dramatic improvement over the Warner Brothers release in many areas, but they are much more of the subtle variety. So I encourage those who think that there wasn't much of a difference or they wanted to hang on to their Warner Brothers release or they might have think, thought it looked better, I encourage you to look more deeply and also look at them in motion because I think here on the Criterion release, you are finally able to really just sink your teeth into 
the subtlety of the visuals and the the beauty of the lighting and the way that the grayscale is handled, which is really in a lot of ways the most difficult part of lighting for black and white film. It's a whole different art form than the lighting for color. And black and white is a little bit of a misnomer in term because it's really black, white, and gray or silver. It's the tones between black and white that are I think where you have the greatest range of expression in terms of how different cameramen approach this. And all of this is changed and heightened by Tolan's use of deep focus, which itself is pushing the film stock and the film stock itself was a new film stock. So there are many factors going on and you have to realize this is compounded by the fact that there is or no original negative to work from. So you're working from a copy and then you're working from a copy of the copy. So you're already a generation away and then two generations away. It also mentions they were grading based on the same reference print that Warner Brothers used and also checking by what the what the Warner team did for the 2011 Blu-ray release. And I also think that Criterion's grading is much more subtle than what Warner Brothers did back in 2011. So that's another reason why I think this improves upon that. It's much more subtle, It's it's it, and it, it serves the film more, ultimately. So I think visually, this is a complete upgrade and worth your money, even if you don't have 4K yet. And the 4K itself uses... Uh, the greater resolution and the Dolby Vision HDR grading to merely allow the film to breathe a bit more. It's not pushing the HDR bright lights and heavy knit uses all over the place uh, like most modern films with HDR do. This is a very carefully done HDR application that is doing what HDR should be doing in a catalog release in terms of HDR should be utilized to allow the film to breathe more, to be able to fully express the visuals to a greater degree, not change the experience by going in and using HDR to change emphasis and change the image to what more modern sensibilities might be. HDR should be used as a way to get, as it's supposed to be, a higher dynamic range. So it should be used to allow the visuals to better represent themselves because they're having more space to play with, essentially. And from my research and from talking to other people on forums and, and digging around, as far as I can tell, that is what the UHD is doing. So it is basically a slight upgrade over the included 1080p disc, but it is not a, you know, like a dramatic night and day improvement because of the limiting factor of the materials they're already having to work with. So do keep that in mind, but I do give this my absolute highest recommendation on the picture quality because it is that important of an upgrade in the visuals alone. As impressive as the picture restoration is, the audio restoration is equally impressive. However, with one caveat, and that is the other factor besides the packaging that holds this release back for me. So for the audio, we have a losslessly encoded PCM mono track. This was the subject of new restoration, brand new scans of the audio elements were done, and in terms of the audio performance, far and away the best audio presentation the film has had in a great number of years. The Warner Brothers releases, starting with the DVD and that carried over to the Blu-ray, were aggressively noise reduced. Uh, the Warner DVD itself has an appalling picture transfer courtesy of Lowry Digital, but the audio was also subjected to a lot of EQ, heavy noise reduction, and just generally sounds uh, just not very good when you compare it to other releases. Uh, the Blu-ray was pretty much the same track rolled over with some slight differences in lossless. And to compare that release, the Warner Blu-ray, to the new Criterion release is a gigantic gigantic eye-opener for those who haven't really looked at a lot of editions of the film on video. Here, that heavy and aggressive noise reduction is gone uh, for, for the most part. You're able to hear many more details that were not present on the Warner releases. Uh, overall, it is a fine restoration job and it is a dramatic improvement on the Warner releases. So for people upgrading from the Warner releases, this isn't just a massive upgrade in picture, it's a massive upgrade in audio. However, the caveat is, and what keeps this release from being perfect in the audio and visual realm, 
is the fact that it is not the best sounding release on home video. There is some noise reduction applied, which obviously is going to have to happen on elements of this sort. However, it is heavier than other releases have done. And so, unfortunately, I do think there are better sounding releases of the film on home video. Uh, they might not be better to some because there is the intrinsic hiss and some intrinsic noise from the source, but you will naturally have that in any film of this era. And on top of that, when you start trying to aggressively remove those, you do run the risk of removing key important frequencies of the original sound itself. So there is a trade-off, and I wish that companies would present unrestored audio tracks as well that doesn't happen very often it used to happen some in the uh, in the laserdisc days some of the dvd days but it doesn't really happen now and that would negate a lot of these issues again as i said there are other releases that i think do sound better uh, in fact there are two i think so i think the criterion release is the third best sounding release of citizen kane uh, the second best sounding one, and the one I thought was the best sounding one for a long time, is actually the old image Laserdisc, uh, and not their original one, but their 1990s reissue, which I have here with the wonderful recreation of the Inquirer cover. What's special about this, it has a aggressively noise-reduced, cleaned-up, restored track on the digital tracks, uh, which is okay, but is unfortunately removed of frequencies as well. But the analog track is an unrestored track and sounds excellent. The only problem, it is on the Laserdisc analog format, which itself does have some intrinsic noise, and unfortunately, the unrestored track is not on the PCM digital track like the noise reduced restored track is and again for the longest time I thought that was the best sounding release of the film there was and this was of course before the Criterion release had come out so lo and behold to my ultimate surprise when I, I, I discovered there was a better sounding version and to my knowledge this is still the best sounding version of the film on home video when I was going through my old VHS tapes from childhood, I still had my original tape of Citizen Kane from the 50th anniversary in 1991. This is the Turner release. Uh, it's the same master that was developed and used for all the video releases, but uh, in every other case, they uh, did some aggressive noise reduction on the various audio tracks of the various releases, but it was not done here. Now, this tape is not in the best shape. I bought it used when I was a kid, and I've watched it many times, and uh, it didn't provide a, a super clean audio experience. But even with that, you could tell, because uh, I, I just captured the audio, and, and I started looking at it in an audio editor, um, it was amazing how much detail was in this that was not in the other releases. So, of course, I did what anybody would do, and I went and got as many other releases that I didn't have and I'd never tried before, and I did a, a sort of detective hunt for the best-sounding audio. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't have any success, but I did go ahead and purchase a fresh sealed copy of the same release, which has a much cleaner audio presentation than my original beat up tape copy. So unfortunately, if you want the absolute best audio for Citizen Kane, I hate to say it, but it is actually on this 1991 VHS tape Hi-Fi Mono. Uh, again, it hasn't been hit with aggressive noise reduction like most every other release. And if you do have a copy of this, you can capture the audio, and it is possible to sync it to the new Criterion release if you desire to. Uh, I do think the new Criterion audio is excellent and far better than the uh, previous Warner releases, which were really terrible in their uses of noise reduction and other things but i do think the criterion release is a third place for audio behind the unrestored analog track on the image laser disc and especially behind the turner vhs tape hi-fi mono so I hate to say it, but this is a key example, or really the prime example I have now found of a VHS tape that actually has superior audio performance due to heavier-handed usage of noise reduction. Now, again, we are talking about 
the same elements they're working from and they are limited but had they not used as much noise reduction on this new release it was possible to have a track that sounded even better than the best sounding previous releases so the trade-off of course is if you go to these older tracks they will have some noise they will have some hiss but it is intrinsic hiss and you are not losing any of the important frequencies of the sound mix and when you compare them directly you can hear the difference and it is it is quite evident but there are some people who can't live with any sort of hiss or intrinsic noise which i can understand so the criterion release will be fine for them and for those who have never heard another version besides the warner releases the criterion will be a massive upgrade in audio as well so again it sounds great i do think it is the third best sounding release of the film on home video but it could have been the best sounding release. That is a bit frustrating. So for me, the the biggest drawback is the fact that the Criterion Kane release doesn't sound as good as it could. It sounds really good. It sounds very good, but the audio isn't perfect because unfortunately the decision was made to apply that degree of noise reduction that does uh, unfortunately start to cut into the sound mix itself. Again, this isn't something that Criterion does and nobody else does. This is a very widespread thing in home video and in archival mastering. Uh, it is a, a, a very delicate balancing act, and I think the Criterion release is excellent in its audio for what it is, and it's a night and day improvement over the Warner treatments on DVD and Blu-ray, but it could have been perfect, and I wish it was. So unfortunately, again, if you want the best-sounding version of Citizen Kane, you need a VHS tape from 1991, and there you have it. I've done I've done a video about this before on my channel, and I, I just I have to reiterate it here because that is my biggest disappointment with this release, and. I could even ignore all of my my uh, problems with the packaging, but that's that's what kills me because the audio is already a great improvement, but it could have been perfect. So now we move on to the extras, which are contained primarily on the third and fourth Blu-ray discs. The feature discs feature three audio commentaries. What's great about this release is it does port over all of the important Warner Brothers extras, so there's really no reason at all to hang on to the previous Warner Brothers discs unless you're a completist or you like the packaging, or if you like the additional Battle Over Citizen Kane documentary, which I really don't recommend because it's historically inaccurate and does sort of paint people in a different light. And I, I, it's, I think it's a shame that's been bundled with the film for so long. So I'm very glad that that is not included here because I, I advise everyone to just skip that because it is not historically accurate uh, in a number of ways. And it does try and paint wells in a different light and many people have have uh, talked about its uh, factual errors and I, again i'm just very glad we don't have that anymore and also the uh, deluxe blu-ray did include the rko 281 film that hbo made uh, that is available separately and it's the same dvd just repackaged so if you really want that you can get that by itself so i think there's no reason to hang on to the warner releases unless you're a completist or you like the packaging. So the brand new commentary, and again, I'm having to look down at my notes because there's a lot of stuff to go over. So the first commentary is by James Nairmore and Jonathan Rosenbaum, uh, both longtime Wells scholars. They also did the commentary track for the Criterion Blu-ray of the Magnificent Ambersons in 2018. Uh, they did the new commentary and it had the original Laserdisc commentary as well. It's a great listen. Uh, it is very much in the moment of, of today, so it is applying some uh, viewpoints of, of today's age to looking at Kane, which is very helpful uh, for those looking for a fresh approach to the film or those coming to the film new for the first time and trying to get a handle on connecting with it. I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful track. Uh, I, 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 as with anything Citizen Kane related, I could have listened for another couple hours and it would have been even better. Uh, but it's, it's great that a new commentary was commissioned because Criterion doesn't do that all the time. And then the two commentaries originally from the Warner Brothers DVD are ported over. They were on the Blu-ray. Now they're here as well. Uh, they are great tracks. The first is from Peter Bogdanovich. It is a very slowly spoken commentary. 
And of course, uh, Bogdanovich's commentaries aren't for everybody in terms of his style of presenting them. But he did have obviously very intimate knowledge, uh, firsthand knowledge of Orson Welles and uh, also of the film. And his insights are great, but it is very much as if you're watching the film with someone and they occasionally will talk a little bit. Um, so there there are some pauses, but there, there aren't any major significant gap. So it's not like a selected scene commentary, but it's still a rewarding track, but it's obviously going to be the one you, you're going to return to the least of the three. And the third is, it needs no introduction. It's Roger Ebert's commentary done for the Warner Brothers DVD. Uh, it is one of the greatest audio commentaries ever recorded, in my opinion. Uh, Ebert brings his incredible sense of, of writing about films and prose into the commentary realm, but also the the down to earth approach he always had and with the energy and with the uh, approachability factor of his famous at the movies demeanor so this is the most focused and energetic and understandable and perfectly digestible commentary track this is one of the commentary tracks you play for people who want to know more about movies and have never listened to a commentary track before. You can play this for people who don't know about making movies, and they can still understand everything. It is a film school in a commentary track. It is the best kind of commentary track. I have listened to it countless times. It never gets old. It is the best commentary on Citizen Kane, um, which there aren't aren't a whole lot. There are obviously these three, plus the old Paul Mandel one from the 1985 Image Laserdisc. Ebert recorded a handful of commentaries for, for various DVDs. Uh, I think this one is, is probably his best. Uh, he also did ones for Dark City and Casablanca as well, among a few others. Uh, but this, this is one of the legendary uh, audio commentaries. It is a must listen. Uh, if you've not heard it, it is so rewarding and you can listen to it uh, every time you rewatch the film. It never gets old. It is the perfect companion piece. And again, one of the absolute greatest audio commentaries ever recorded. So that's it for the extras on the features disc. Then we go over to Blu-ray disc two two which has the bulk of the extras along with disc three so again i'm reading off the list here so disc two the primary feature is the amazing the complete citizen kane documentary this was made for the bbc and shown back in 1991 it features inter interviews with original cast and crew it has interview segments with wells himself it has William Allen himself do the narration for the for the documentary in the style of his News on the March newsreel voice. Uh, it is uh, made, obviously, by fans of the film. Uh, it has details that no one else goes into. It is the best documentary on Citizen Kane. And um, even though it is obviously originally and, and being sourced from standard def tape materials and is not HD, it's still... That doesn't matter. It is beautifully produced. It even opens with a recreation uh, or an imagined version of the opening of the original Heart of Darkness film that Wells was to have made, uh, rendered in a, a similar form to the opening of Citizen Kane. Uh, it also shows the, the a very rare clip of the reel that was actually colorized of Citizen Kane uh, during the colorization controversy that, that uh, happened. Thankfully, only a reel of Citizen Kane was completed as test footage. And you get to see a little clip of that in the documentary and just how terrible uh, it looks. And thank God that that was never completed as a colorized feature as some films were done under the Turner Library. But that's just it, those are just examples to give you an idea of how complete this is. It is feature length. It's about 95, I think it's 96 minutes long total. And there is no better documentary that I'm aware of on Citizen Kane. It, and thank God goodness we finally can get rid of battle over citizen kane which is a terrible documentary uh, in terms of presenting the history of citizen kane uh, complete citizen kane does i think the most exceptional job of presenting all the facts and getting firsthand direct interviews with people and firsthand sources and also it goes to incredible links to give you 
more ideas of how the film was birthed and how it how its legacy developed. And even though this was made for the 50th anniversary, it still holds up today as the best documentary made on Citizen Kane. Now, next is a segment entitled Working on Kane. This is actually compiled from the interviews made for the 50th anniversary Laserdisc Special Edition, released in 1991, Spine 142, where you got the entire final side comprised of various talking head interviews of people who worked on the film and famous people today and talking about its influence. Unfortunately, on the Laserdisc, it is a lot of people talking, so they are all packaged in in packages of threes, and you have to switch the, to the different audio tracks to hear the person you want to hear. And each person only gets to talk for about a minute or two. It's obviously cut down from a longer interview. So we have a whole number of people on here, and when you look at it, it totals about, an, about 55 minutes of interview material and then you look at the other audio tracks for the other two people in each of the segments of three people. So what Criterion has done is gone back to those, and we're finally getting much more of the complete interview session with those people. The, the unfortunate part is it's not everybody. So there's still people you see on the Laserdisc that have never been seen from these interview sessions anywhere else. Uh, Turner also did their own edit of some of these and released it on VHS tape as reflections on Citizen Kane. So here for Working on Kane, we get to hear from Ruth Warwick, who played the first Mrs. Kane in the film. And then we also get to hear from uh, effects pioneer Lynn Wynn Dunn about the optical printer usage in working with Wells. And we get to hear from Robert Wise, who talks about editing the film and working with Wells wells and the the, uh, the the creative genius that was going on and that felt sort of like it was in the air and also the hair pulling out factor of trying to achieve all of this stuff it's it's a great great thing to be able to see it in its entirety for the most part unfortunately the robert wise footage it seems like they had to source from a lower generation uh source so it's also got a baked in time code in it so i don't know if the original video footage was lost or, or what what it is but even even with that this is still the the complete interview that we've never seen before it's even more complete than the turner uh, reflections on citizen kane to vhs documentary so it's great to finally get to hear all of their thoughts uh but and this is what we'll see in the other usages of the laserdisc interviews but unfortunately we're not getting all of the Laserdisc interviews, which I think is a shame, would have been great because there's still several people on the Laserdisc that have never been heard from more, uh, like Joe Dante, for example, is not on the, the any of the Blu-ray extras, but I don't know if it was maybe a, a licensing thing or a rights thing or something, but we get most of the interview content, but unfortunately not all of it. Uh, then we move on to On Toland, where we have Alan Davio, Haskell Wexler, and Vilma Sigmund talking about Toland and Citizen Kane, again, from the Laserdisc interview sessions, but here in their entirety, it's absolutely great and essential. All of these vintage interviews are fantastic, and it's great getting to see them in their entirety, and it's also a nice time capsule of its uh, recording time of 1990 and 91, too. Then we get a new extra from Criterion. This is where Craig Barron and Ben Burt talk about Citizen Kane and its effects and the various trick shots and the usage of sound. This is very much like what they've done on extras for other Criterion releases like The Incredible Shrinking Man. As always, you could listen to these two talk about effects in films for hours. It's a great uh almost 30 minute long extra and to be honest I could have listened to it for two hours and it and still I still would have been uh, ready for another two hours so absolutely fantastic then we move on to a new video essay by Robert Carringer who wrote the essential book The Making of Citizen Kane one of the great Wells scholars who's done great works on not just Citizen Kane but of course the Magnificent Amersons as well uh, he does a new 14 minute uh, video essay talking about Kane. Then Farron Smith Neem talks about, uh, in, in particular, talking about the relationship between Citizen Kane and William Randolph Hearst and the story being based on Hearst. This is a very excellent piece giving you more historical context and background context on Hearst and also a very uh, accurate rendering of, of the, the relationship between 
Kane being based primarily around Hearst and what Hearst did in the release aftermath uh, of, of trying to suppress the film. Uh, and, and this is far better than the depiction of what you got in Battle Over Citizen Kane. So it's necessary to have something covering that topic in the extras. And this is a, a wonderful uh, uh, extra to do to serve that purpose. So I think Neem does a very great job in, in this piece of covering that material and giving you that necessary historical background. Then in the one that I think will be the most helpful to new viewers and young viewers coming to Kane for the first time is reframing. Kane. That's where Raquel Gates talks about having to actually find new and current ways to present Citizen Kane to uh, classes she teaches and young students. So although it may make you wince a little bit to, to, to hear all the ways she's having to come up with, all the things she's having to cook up to try and, and make it palatable and, and make it able to have... Uh, young people of 2022 be able to connect to Citizen Kane, even though it might make you wince a little bit, it makes perfect sense. And this is what anybody would have to do to try and bridge that gap. And it's it's a really nice and well thought out uh, featurette where she's going through all the things she's done over the years to, to uh, try and ha make it more digestible, essentially, to bridge the gap of all the generations so that kids today or students today can actually see Susan Kane and connect to it in a direct way. Then we get a eight minute piece of Martin Scorsese talking about Citizen Kane and its impact on him. This is again from the Laserdisc interviews and it's the full uh, interview. So it's Scorsese just sitting on a couch talking about Citizen Kane in 1990 for eight minutes. So it's like, okay, I'm hanging on every word. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so it's, and it's fantastic to finally see the full thing instead of the little two minute clip from the laser disc. Uh, then we also have the wonderful little uh, 11 minute stills photography gallery with Roger Ebert narration. This was done for the DVD released by Warner carried over to the Blu-ray. It's carried over here as well. He covers some of the same stuff he does in his commentary, but this is basically just him talking over some selected stills that were chosen for this little stills gallery. And it's it's great that that has been preserved because uh, all, any Roger Ebert material is worth your time, and especially talking about Citizen Kane. So uh, this is just an, another nice little piece that has been preserved from the Warner Brothers releases. Then we get a vintage newsreel of the opening of Citizen Kane. This is really the only footage there is of the of the premiere and we see Wells's appearance and it's that great you are there time capsule sort of feel that you get when you see newsreels of film openings it's great that this survived and of course you can see it's actually only playing at the RKO theater because that was the only theater it could play at because of Hearst uh, so it's great that's been included and then we also get the film's trailer which is one of the most groundbreaking amazing fantastic full of life and vigor trailers there is we have uh, it's full of custom footage of the actors sort of clowning around uh, with wells narrating it uh, we get some extra glimpses of some of the sets uh, from different angles that we don't see in the film it's a must watch and it plays with the whole concept of of a trailer in ways that very few trailers did of the classic studio era so it is one of the great trailers it is just as inventive as the film itself Unfortunately, though, it hasn't been fully restored. It would be amazing if this had been fully restored and presented in a beautiful HD transfer as well. Uh, it just hasn't, unfortunately. It does look a little bit better than the other versions, but usually it's just the same standard depth uh, source up converted or ported over and over again. So unfortunately, the trailer itself isn't restored, uh, but it's it's great that it has been included because it is truly important. Then we move on to Blu-ray Disc 3, where we get the uh, what seems to be the big focus new extra, and that is a newly produced uh, Criterion extra called My Guest is Orson Welles. This is a compilation of various uh, late career appearances on on the various talk shows that he would do, primarily uh, on Merv Griffin shows and also the Dick Cavett show, which he appeared on for both many times. Uh, his television appearances are legendary. Uh, it kind of became a sort of uh, means of furthering his career because he could uh, just come on and regale everyone with amazing stories and, and charm the entire viewing audience. And you're just hanging on to every word and fascinated ever, just as you are every time Wells ever opens his mouth in front of a camera. Uh, but 
it's it's absolutely wonderful. It's wonderfully edited. It runs 43 minutes, and it also includes, uh, rather sadly, the very last one he did on October 10th, 1985, which was the day he died. Uh, so he recorded an, a, a final television show interview uh, just hours before his death. Uh, and they're, they're cut together and, and sort of broken up into different themes. But uh, it, it would have been great to just have all of the various <laughs> interviews on one place on disc, but uh, they might not have had the rights or the space to do that. I understand that. So it's, it's a really great and essential thing for people who have never seen these before or who want to know more about Wells or Wells in his later days. This is a great way to do so. And, of course, he was doing these shows primarily as a ways to get money to make the films he was already still trying to complete. But he is wonderfully loose and candid and just just firing away with just amazing anecdotes and stories and and you just before you know it it's been the full 43 minutes and you're just like wait that's it that's it that's all um you can see the full interviews on YouTube if you look them up. They're usually floating around in different places online. Wells fans like myself will have seen most, if not all, of these, but it's great to have them here on disc and edited together in this beautiful new package. Then we get two fascinating archival interviews with Joseph Cotton, who was not just one of the stars of the Mercury Theater, but a, you know, a longtime friend and associate of Wells. And it is, and being a giant Joseph Cotton fan, of course, it's fascinating. So the first one is a 1966 interview for Granada Television in the UK. It's 16 minutes, it's black and white in a traditional old-fashioned type interview, and it's absolutely fascinating because it's Joe Cotton just talking about Orson Welles and Citizen Kane and Ambersons and, and screen acting in general. It's absolutely fascinating. You feel like a fly on the wall, sort of, and uh, just an absolutely wonderful interview that you wish was a couple hours long. The second is actually, it's not really an interview, it's Joseph Cotton's uh, speech at the AFI Orson Welles tribute where he want, was given the Lifetime Achievement Award and was hoping that would help get him financing to finish films like Other Side of the Wind. Unfortunately, it, it didn't really, but it is done in the same manner and style as the other AFI Lifetime Achievement Awards in the 70s and 80s. So if you've ever seen any of those, it's very much like that. But Cotton gives it gives a wonderful, very warm little speech. And it's it's a great it's a great moment from that broadcast. Then we get another 23 minute segment of uncut Laserdisc interviews. This is entitled Knowing Wells. And in here, we hear from Peter Bogdanovich, Henry Jaglum, Frank Marshall, and Martin Ritt, along with Gary Graver, uh, talking about not just working with Wells, but knowing Wells on a personal basis, and also talking about his, his later period, because most of these people were involved with the making of The Other Side of the Wind. Again, it's great to get these in their more uncut form from the Laserdisc, and it's another section of these Laserdisc interviews that are just pure gold. Then we get a 1996 interview with William Allen, who was part of the Mercury Group, played Mr. Thompson in the film, did the narrator of the News on the March, and was was another key player in the Mercury group and went on after his time with the Mercury to produce a great number of films himself, most famously a number of the great classic 1950s science fiction and monster films at Universal, most well-known of them, of course, being Creature from the Black Lagoon. This is a 21-minute interview, and as always, it's great getting the first-hand uh, information from the people who were actually there. And Alan himself is a great interviewee, and he's great also, of course, in the Complete Citizen Kane documentary. So we just get more of him here, which is fantastic. Then there is a lovely and very charming uh, newer piece from that was actually made for Criterion Channel in 2017 called Orson Welles on the Nose. This is all about Welles' fascinating fascination with changing his own nose through fake noses and makeup and how he did it not just in Citizen Kane but throughout his entire life in both film and uh, on, in television and on the stage and it goes through an examination of his various prop noses and the the molds taken of his nose and the various noses he would wear in different films and how the noses differed from his real nose and how they would differ from film to film based on the character the nose is different in Kane the nose is different uh, in uh, Chimes at Midnight from it, uh, how it looks in Touch of Evil and so on and so forth. So 
it's an absolutely fascinating little nine minute featurette originally for the Criterion channel, and I'm so glad it was included here as well. Then we get an HD presentation of Wells' first ever film, which is 1934's The Hearts of Age. This is a silent short that was thought lost for a great number of years. This was made when Wells was still at the Todd School for Boys and was is really his first experiment with, uh, with a camera. Uh, it is... Uh, you, it's a bit all over the place, like most first films are. You could call it an experimental film. It is sort of playing around with a little bit of, almost like it perhaps is making fun of German expressionism a little bit. Uh, it is it is very much just a miracle that it survives, and it's somebody picking up a camera for the first time, really a, as a kid, and just sort of playing around with it. Um, again, it's great to have here. It's amazing that it's been restored and cleaned up, and uh, again, I just never have seen it looking this nice, so I'm very happy that it was included in the extras. Then we get uh, to round things off, we get a segment called the Mercury Theater, and this is broken up into five different pieces. So first is a 51-minute episode of the South Bank Show, which is uh, focusing on a profile of John Houseman, the producer, and he was the producing partner of Wells and the Mercury Theater uh, until they had a falling out, but Houseman did work on Citizen Kane. So we get Houseman talking about Wells, but it's a it's a really nice overview of his career and his life and his outlook on things and and the the craft of acting and uh, I you know I thought I was just going to skim through it and I found myself watching the whole thing. He does give his own interpretation of the how the Kane writing process went, uh, which he did skew in a certain way in his later years, um, which is unfortunate. I don't know why he did that, but um, he repeats that here. Uh, but it's it's a great piece and it's nice to see a longer form profile on on. Houseman, who very frequently gets overlooked. And then, very importantly, we get the 1979 Merv Griffin Show episode, where Wells and Houseman uh, sort of buried the hatchet and had their first real meeting since uh, breaking up all those years before. And uh, they, they seem to really enjoy each other's company, and it's a wonderful episode where they're just talking away and about the, the current state of acting and, and film and television, and um, it, it seems like they just sort of pick up right where they left off. So it's great that they were able to sort of bury the hatchet in that way, and even and just as great that it's included here because these are important parts of the the, the aftermath of Kane, and uh, Houseman was such an important figure in Wells's career. And we round this off with three important Mercury episodes of of Wells projects uh, from the radio days. So this has some of the best Mercury and Campbell theater of the air episodes. Uh, we get the 1938 adaptation. Of of Dracula, which is an incredible radio production. Wells was very fond of Stoker's novel and uh, always proposed that no, no film had been made that really did the book, which he is very much correct for the most part. Some get rather close, some do the book in different ways, but the, the book itself still really hasn't had a 100% definitive proper adaptation. And the radio version they did is is a perfect entry point for people who are curious about Wells's radio career because here you have this huge, sprawling, iconic classic novel told in the form of diary ent entries and letters and telegrams from different perspectives and different people, and he's able to distill it all down to a single hour on the radio, and it's riveting and incredible, and you can listen to it every Halloween and enjoy the hell out of it. So it's a great introduction for people to uh, Wells's radio career outside of War of the Worlds, which everybody knows, but you know, some have listened to it, but, uh, you know, they usually don't go beyond that, which is a shame because Wells himself and everyone else even said it wasn't even one of their best shows. So we also get their version of Heart of Darkness, which runs about 35 minutes. So uh, it, the success of this led to it being proposed as the first RKO film. So when you listen to this, you get the idea or at least some general sense of what a Wells Heart of Darkness film could have been like. It's a great adaptation, uh, but it is having to cram it all down into 35 minutes. And then uh, as a really great touch, we get the 1941 play that's credited to Wells, His Honor the Mayor, which runs about a half hour. Uh, this is a great uh, morality play about a small town mayor who has to deal with a uh, with a hate group uh, deciding to have a meeting and uh, him not being able to stop them because of their right to free speech and if he stops them from doing that then he's going against the Bill of Rights and and the and the principles of, of democracy so it's a great 
uh, very prescient, uh, still prescient today, morality play that's uh, very well done and full of humor and full of drama, and you can very much see it as as a film. Like, you can literally see it in your head. So it's, it's one of those great radio plays that could easily be turned into a film, and it's very underrated. I think it's one of the best uh, uh, radio dramas that uh, Wells ever did. Uh, again, it is credited as being written by Wells, but I think there is some discussion about that, uh, whether he co-wrote it or somebody else wrote it. I'm not sure. But um, it, it's, a, it's a great radio play, and it closes out the Mercury Theater uh, section of the extras. So that is the Criterion Spine 1104 release of Citizen Kane. It has a phenomenal extras package, which still leaves you wanting more, even with two Blu-rays of additional content. I think that speaks to the film's power, and uh, it just encourages you to dig deeper and further always. Uh, the picture transfer is fantastic, I think, in picture and sound. It is a gigantic improvement over the Warner release, but in uh, ways that are much more subtle to uh, most viewers. So, I, I and what the extras carried over from the Warner release, I think there's no reason to hang on to those unless you're a completist. And the only real drawbacks here, I think, uh, I do wish all of the Laserdisc interviews had been included, but again, I don't know if that was a space or rights issue. Uh, that That is one point I, I would like to make. Uh, the other is the packaging, which is really just terrible in terms of the design and layout and uh, how you're going to damage your disc. So that is unfortunate. The disc replacement issue did, was was a bit of a pain because it did take quite some time to get the, the replacement disc, but you know at least it was simple and straightforward and we eventually all got a replacement disc so that that was fine I, I don't mind that uh but i think that the biggest issue for me personally over everything is the 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 audio restoration is is a is a little bit too overzealous and this could have been definitive in both picture and sound and unfortunately it isn't in sound it is a giant upgrade over the warner brothers releases but it still uh could sound better it's unfortunate that it doesn't um so that's that's what really holds it back for me from being uh, a, a definitive citizen kane release uh, other than that, it, it is the best release the film has had so far on home video. The 4K does give you some nice improvement over the 1080p presentation. And the extras package is fantastic and only leaves you wanting more in the best sort of way uh, in terms of it, it's still not enough with two extra Blu-rays of additional features. So that that's my final summary overall. Uh, I hope that made sense. Uh, if you're not going to get super technical into comparing different versions i think this is by far and away the best release that has ever existed uh, on home video i think this is a must own for anybody with a blu-ray player anyone interested in films anyone who collects films you need a copy of citizen kane to go back to over and over and over for inspiration this is the way to do it uh, it wipes the floor with the warner brothers editions in both picture and sound uh and the extras package is far far greater in both scope and scale and it includes all of the important extras and commentaries from the warner brothers releases so those are maintained um so it is it is a must own release even if you're not 4k ready yet uh the blu-ray is itself a massive improvement i just wish it didn't have this really terrible packaging i i wish they'd included all of the laserdisc interviews uh, uh, in the extras uh, again, I don't know if that was possible. It may be for rights or space reasons, but I wish they were all on here. Uh, but again, I have to come back to the fact that I wish the audio was 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 better. Um, and I wish the audio was definitive, like I think the the picture restoration is. And it's it's close. That's what makes it really frustrating. Is that the audio is really a definitive, a great improvement, but it's still not definitive. It could be a perfect release in the technical spec. It's very, very close, but uh, the audio is still, I think, only third best to some older releases. So that is the Criterion Spine 1104 release for Citizen Kane, bringing the film back to the collection after it hit it. It has been gone since the original Laserdisc era. Uh, it's amazing that Criterion was able to get Kane back in the fold. Uh, it's really coming full circle from the original 1984 Spine number one release. Again, this is a must-own. This is for anyone who loves films. 
who loves watching movies and who loves uh, special editions and loves getting to know more about films through extras packages. It's a must own. It's better than the Warner Brothers Blu-ray in every way, um, just with certain caveats and, and, and drawbacks, I think, that are unfortunate, um, like the packaging, but especially the, the audio. Um, but still, don't, don't let that discourage you. Please get a copy of this and re-experience Kane or experience it for the first time in what I think is the best experience that you can have with, with the film outside of, an, outside of a theater on a print. Uh, I do think this is the best uh, home presentation the film has ever had uh, in picture, most of all, as absolutely, without question. Uh, in audio, it's not quite there, but it is rather close. So again, it's a must-own title from Criterion, one of their most important releases ever, and their entry into the 4K UHD realm. So, as always, I hope this has been informative, somewhat fun. I know it's a little bit longer, but there was a lot of ground to cover, and of course, being a Wells and Kane fanatic, I can't just simply talk a little bit about Citizen Kane. And there was a, there's a lot of technical information to go over, and quite a number of extras. So, uh, if you've already had the Criterion release and have some experience with it, I would love to hear your thoughts below. Uh, if you're interested in picking up the Criterion release or you were sort of debating on uh, picking it up or uh, didn't know if you needed to, if you had the Warner Brothers disc, I hope this has been helpful in helping you uh, make the decision. I cannot encourage you strongly enough to do so because the improvements are are very dramatic but in much more subtle areas so i'd like to just say keep your disc spinning keep physical media alive by supporting boutique labels and studio labels and purchasing physical media releases and as always thanks ever so much for watching i've got to go and gift wrap my uh, box of cigars i've got to make sure and doctor it up because it's the only way i can get uh poor old jed Leland some cigars because you know those doctors they just want to keep him alive